Hello, everyone. Thank you so much for joining us. This is Mary Ann Harvey. I'm a project specialist here at the Court Improvement Project. And we are very happy to be hosting this webinar today on special immigrant juvenile status. Um, today presenting, we have from the Immigrant Legal Center. Um, so we have Virginia Mains and Mindy Rush Chipman. Um, Virginia Mains is the Child and Family Managing Attorney for the Immigrant Legal Center. She oversees a team of individuals specializing in working with immigrant children and their families. She previously interned for the U.S. Immigration Court in Kansas City, as well as Kids in Need of Defense in Washington, D.C. Virginia speaks Spanish and is licensed to practice law in Missouri and Nebraska, and also is a member of the American Immigration Lawyers Association. Um, Mindy Rush Chipman is the Senior Managing Attorney. She oversees the Immigrant Legal Center's immigrant-focused medical legal partnership and rural capacity building programs both aimed at promoting inclusivity by offering immigration education and advocacy, as well as direct immigration legal services to immigrants receiving services from partnering healthcare providers or living in rural communities. Previously, Mindy worked as an attorney at Legal Aid of Nebraska, where she helped develop the Nebraska Immigration Legal Assistance Hotline. She had her own general law practice and was often appointed to represent parties um, or as guardian ad litem in juvenile proceedings. Mindy is licensed to practice law in Nebraska and Colorado. Just a reminder, just please um, mute your lines um, and please don't put the line on hold because there is a lot of quick feedback. Um, so thank you so much for joining us today and I'm going to turn it over to Virginia and Mindy. All right, I think we're ready to go. This is Mindy and I'm going to start out. Um, the first slide here is one of the statues that Virginia and I like to kind of um, highlight the need for immigration legal services for kids that are in juvenile court. Oftentimes when we're working with kiddos that have been abused, abandoned, or neglected, or kids that are in the juvenile jurisdiction for whatever reason, um, we don't necessarily uh, focus on the immigration status of the child because there's other things going on and sometimes we don't know what services are available, what options are available, and how to connect um, the child with those services. That's kind of the point of this webinar is we're going to talk about our services particularly. We're going to talk about a few different forms of immigration relief that are available to children. Um, we're going to focus on special immigrant juvenile status. But as you'll hear throughout the webinar, there's other forms of relief that are also available for children depending on their particular circumstances. Um, so if we go to the next slide, we'll see here our brief agenda. Um, like Marianne said, our immigrants, a little bit more about our organization. We'll do a very brief overview of immigration law. Um, Virginia and I went to law school and we've practiced immigration law for years and we still don't know everything about immigration law. So obviously it's going to be just a, a touch on it. Immigration laws are changing literally every day. We'll talk a little bit about updates to the DACA program. Um, but then we'll get more into the particular forms of immigration relief that you might um, see or have available to the children that you're working with in juvenile court. And then we'll end with ways that you can help. Um, so the Immigrant Legal Center, formerly Justice for Our Neighbors Nebraska, is a nonprofit law firm. We provide uh, immigration legal services, education, and advocacy. Um, we don't charge for our services. All of our clients are low income, though, um, primarily below 150% of the federal poverty guidelines. Um, it's really nice to be able to provide free legal services because that way our clients know that we have no benefit in the advice that we're giving them, and we're only going to tell them to apply for an immigration form of relief if they qualify. Um, like we've said at Nauseam, uh, we've changed our name to the Immigrant Legal Center last week, actually. And our name is just more descriptive about the services that we provide. We're hoping that our clients can more easily find us. However, we're still an affiliate of the Justice for Our Neighbors Network, and our mission has not changed. We did recently relocate, relocate our offices. Um, we were in South Omaha on 24th and E, but we've moved to the Kenoa building on 42nd and 7th. 
Within the Immigrant Legal Center, we have several different programs and we focus our services um, throughout the state of Nebraska and also in parts of Iowa. Virginia works um, on the Child and Welfare Team. She manages that program and she manages the Attorney of the Day program. That program focuses on making sure children in immigration court have representation, children and families have the representation they need to stay reunited or be reunified. One thing that's cool about the Attorney of the Day program is um, Virginia and her team make sure that there's no child that has to go in front of an immigration judge uh, without somebody sitting by their side, which is a very daunting thing, as you can imagine. Um, and at the end, we'll talk about ways that private attorneys can volunteer for that. Um, the Immigrant Focused Medical Legal Partnership is pretty cool. Uh, we work with healthcare organizations, and it's really just doctors and lawyers working together to make sure that immigration legal needs um, are addressed so that way the family can focus on the health of the child and the family and just focus on getting better. The Rural Community Inclusion Program, we focus on getting immigration legal services to some of the most vulnerable among us. Um, as you know, there are limited attorneys in our rural communities in Nebraska, but particularly there is, is a limited number of qualified immigration. So we try to remove that barrier. Um, by working with the local communities to grow their capacity to provide those immigration legal services from within the communities. Um, we also have a domestic violence program where we work closely with law enforcement. We try to provide services to victims of domestic violence and other crimes. We also provide services in Iowa, and we have an immigrant worker legal partnership. So we've had the poll open to give us a little bit more information about yourself. And interestingly enough, um, over half of you guys are not caseworkers or attorneys. So if you are so inclined, you can go ahead and type in the chat box a little bit more about yourself, just so we, um, we know who we're presenting to, um, and so we can gear our presentation to make sure we're meeting your needs. Also, I should point out that if at any point in time you have a question, feel free to, to type it in the chat box and we'll try to um, answer it as it comes up organically. Also, if there's um, something that we are not able to answer, we're going to copy the questions and make sure that we answer everyone's questions when we send out the slides at the end of the program. And we want to thank you for those who have already been typing into the chat. We see that there may be an issue with the phone audio being poor. So if you are hearing us, please feel free to write that in and we'll do what we can on our end to make sure that you can hear us. So thank you for that. All right, we're just trying to end the polls and publish the results so you guys can see who is on the webinar right now. Um, now that we've, if someone could type in, can you see the results of, now that we've end, ended the poll? No. All right, well, we'll keep going, um, but we'll see if we can't figure that out as we're going. Thank you, it's really helpful for us to get an idea of um, who it is that we're talking to as we go forward. So, um, as Mindy said, I'm just going to give a very, very brief intro to immigration law, and it's only to kind of provide some context to special immigrant juvenile status. Um, so, the U.S. immigration system, as you can see from this slide, is complicated with a lot of different players. Both the executive, legislative, as well as the judicial branches are involved. And so we just wanted to throw it up there in this help, hopefully helpful chart um, so that I can explain a couple of these agencies because as we go on in the presentation, you'll probably hear us say, for example, USCIS and wonder, what is that? What are they talking about? So USCIS is a part of the Department of Homeland Security, which is under the executive branch. And they are the agency that um, will do the adjudication of immigration petitions. So as we talk about special immigrant juvenile status particularly, you have to fill out an application and you send it off to USCIS, US Citizenship and Immigration Services. Also under the Department of Homeland Security, there is Customs and Border Patrol, CBP. Those are the people where if you have ever exited the country and come back in, 
they're checking your passport, hopefully they say welcome home, welcome to the United States, you have just had an encounter with CBP. And then also under the Department of Homeland Security, we have ICE, Immigration and Customs Enforcement. These are um, basically the police arm of the Department of Homeland Security. So if you've heard about ICE showing up at a, at a home to arrest a family, going to a workplace, this is who they are. They're ICE and they are an agency under the Department of Homeland Security. Also a player in the U.S. immigration system is the Department of Justice, um, where we're talking about Immigration Court, the Executive Office of Immigration Review. We have your local immigration court, your immigration judge here in Omaha, and then if you end up needing to appeal that decision, that would go to the Board of Immigration Appeals. And that is all under the Department of Justice, the Executive Office of Immigration Review. Then, if you end up needing to appeal your case further, it gets a little confusing, because you actually jump over to the judicial branch at that point, um, to your Court of Appeals, and eventually your Supreme Court. Um, but at the local level, here in Omaha, if you have, you're working with a child and they're in immigration court, that's under the Department of Justice, which is actually part of the executive branch. Um, and then we also have the Department of State as a player with the U.S. Consulates Abroad. If maybe someone you're working with has a family member that lives outside of the United States and wants to come over, they're going to have their interview at the U.S. Consulate, which is a part of the Department of State. And last but not least, we have um, Department of Health and Human Services. Um, with the Office of Refugee Resettlement. If you see minors who have entered the country without parental supervision, frequently if they were caught at the border, they're put into the custody of the Office of Refugee Resettlement and the Department of Health and Su Human Services, and then released to a sponsor here in Omaha. So if you see Office of Refugee Resettlement, I get a lot of questions, oh, that must mean the child is a refugee, right? <laughs> No, that's not what it means. It just means that they were under the Office of Refugee Resettlement when they entered as an unaccompanied, no parental supervision when they entered the country. So that was a very, very quick, brief overview of how the system works and who the different players are. Feel free, if you have questions about it, to type into the chat and we'll try to get them. Um, but we're going to move on to what is the immigration status? What, who are the members of our community? And going back to that first slide that Mindy talked about with the statute and the purposes of the juvenile court system creating this safe and stable environment, you're going to want to know what is the immigration status of the child that I'm working with or the child that I see, and how can we make it more stable? Um, how can we move along the chain? So these are listed from the most stable, if you will, immigration status to the least, and the most stable being U.S. citizenship. You have U.S. citizenship, that's not something that's ever going to be taken away. And there are different ways that you can get U.S. citizenship. By birth, by acquisition, that means, okay, you're born outside of the United States, but your parents are U.S. citizens. So you acquired citizenship even though you weren't born in the United States. By naturalization, that means you've been here for a certain amount of time, you meet all the requirements, you take a test, and you're granted citizenship. And then last but not least is by derivation meaning you came to the United States as a child, your parents came as a ch while you were still a child, they naturalized and became U.S. citizens. Well, you don't have to take the test. You don't have to naturalize. You will get citizenship by derivation because your parents naturalized and became U.S. citizens. So that's the U.S. citizen side, like the most stable potential status that you could have. And then we have all of our non-U.S. citizens. So the most stable within that are going to be your lawful permanent residence. Um, lawful permanent residency is what it sounds like. It's permanent. Um, I got, again, get a lot of questions because the card says it expires in 10 years, so that must mean it's not permanent. No, your status continues. You just have to continue to renew your card. Now, it is less stable than U.S. citizenship because it can be taken away for certain criminal convictions, um, but it is in other, all other ways, permanent. Um, other types of non-U.S. citizens, people who are fleeing persecution, refugees and asylees, um, are going to have a different status, um, and they are going to want to adjust and become permanent residents if they can, and then continue to move on towards citizenship. Um, then we have people who have temporary permission. If you've been following the news, you've probably heard a lot about temporary status, TPS. Um, for certain countries that are experiencing emergencies at any particular point. 
Then we have non-immigrant people who are coming but don't intend to stay here permanently, for example, people on student visas. And then last would be people who are undocumented, who don't have any type of status here in the United States. Moving on. I really like um, Virginia's last slide, and I just wanted to point out that, um, as you can see, there's different ways that you can acquire your citizenship, but oftentimes um, someone can be a citizen and not even know it. So it's really important that we obviously can't judge someone's immigration status by looking at them, but sometimes we can't even judge their immigration status by what they say. When a child uh, acquires or derives their citizenship, it's not as if um, USCIS is going to send them their citizenship certificate. It doesn't work that way. So we've actually had clients come into our office wanting to apply for some other form of immigration relief come to find out through a consultation and investigation they're already citizens. I think that's really something um, for all of us to keep in the back of our minds. Thanks, Cindy. Um, and so just real briefly, broadly, um, we tend to think of immigration um, options and relief in, in terms of four different types of programs. There's family-based immigration, and we'll touch on that. There's humanitarian programs, so special immigrant juvenile status would be one of these humanitarian programs along with refugee and asylum. And then we have employment-based immigration and diversity. We don't have time to tackle every single part of, the, of immigration law today, and we're not even going to try. So we're only going to focus on special immigrant juvenile status and a few of the other humanitarian programs, and then very briefly on family-based immigration. But just wanted to let you know that there may be additional offer, or, uh, options through these other two programs. But it is important to note that employment-based immigration and diversity-based um, options are not typically available to our clientele. Um, for employment-based, you have to have an employer that's willing to petition for you, hire an attorney, pay lots of money, and prove that there's not enough skilled workers to fill this position they want you to fill. Diversity, um, you have to be from a country with a relatively low migration um, history. And so our clients that are coming from Mexico, China, Philippines, India don't even qualify. And you also have to have access to the internet, a certain number of years, or a profession. There's a lot of requirements. So those two forms of relief often aren't available for our clients and um, certainly are not usually available for kids that are in the juvenile court system. So Virginia did a good job of talking about the humanitarian forms of relief as being one type of uh, path to citizenship. The one that we want to focus on today is Special Immigrant Juvenile Status, or SIJS, or SIJ. Um, this is another poll. Hopefully, we can publish the results. But if you want to take a second and just let us know what your experience with Special Immigrant Juvenile Status is. Um, if you've never heard of it, if you've never heard of SIJ, that's OK. Just let us know so that way we can gear the presentation um, towards your experience level. If you have heard of SIJ, that's great. But if you don't have any direct experience working with it, um, let us know that. And then if you've worked with a lot of kids that have applied for SIJ or perhaps been granted SIJ status and moved on to obtain the residency, let us know if that's been under five or more than five. And um, if none of those options apply, let us know. So it looks like most of us have heard of SIJ, but do not have any direct experience working with SIJ youth or cases. Some of us have never heard of SIJ before, and some have worked on less than five cases. So that's good to know. Thank you, guys. It's really good to know. So, we'll, so, so we're not going to get into the nitty gritty this time. Marianne and Tracy can help us with maybe a more advanced SIJ webinar sometime in the future. But we're going to try to focus on the nuts and bolts today. Um, but then there's going to be, uh, obviously, an opportunity to ask more detailed questions in the chat box and then at the end of the presentation. So special immigrant juvenile status, it is not a new form of immigration relief. It was created a long time ago. It was most recently amended in the Bush administration in 2008. But basically, it protects kids that have been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or more of their parents. Um, it's a form of relief that will eventually allow the child to apply for their permanent residency or for their green card. So when we say LPR or lawful permanent resident, that's the same thing as saying green card holder. 
Um, the LPR cards used to be green. They're not green right now, but I think they're going to be green again in the future. So saying green card holder is perfectly acceptable. Um, but so SIJ is actually a path that a child can receive a permanency in the United States and eventually apply to become a citizen. And like Virginia said, that's the most stable form of uh, immigration status that you can have here in the United States. Another important reason that SIJ is a, is a great form of relief for kids that are in juvenile court is because once you've submitted your application for SIJ um, to USCIS, like Virginia said, um, you become eligible for certain public benefits. So it's really important when we have kids that um, are coming from home countries where they have never seen a doctor before, they've never seen a dentist before. There's, there's a high level of medical needs for some of these kiddos. And um, the SIJ form of relief does prevent, does allow them to become eligible, so more of those um, treatment efforts are available to the kids. One thing that's really, really important to note is that if a child um, obtains SIJ status, their parents can never benefit from that child's immigration status. This is something that's really important to talk about lately because of the controversy with chain migration and things of that nature. If a kid's been abused, abandoned, neglected by their mom or their dad, neither their mom or their dad can benefit from their immigration status. Sometimes it's very unfortunate when we have um, a victim parent who's also been abused um, by the abusive parent that mom or dad can never benefit from the child's SIJ status. So sometimes this isn't the right choice for a family, but it's definitely important that the family knows that it exists and they're able to make the informed choice on whether it's a good form of relief for that child or not. So in order to be eligible for SIJ, uh, you have to be under 21 years old. You have to be unmarried. That's important because a lot of, well, a few of our clients have come to us um, after being forced to enter into marriages at a very, very young age. If we can get the child unmarried, um, the best uh, result would be an annulment. Before the child turns 21, then the SIJ is still an option for that child. But we have to act quick. Um, the child cannot apply from outside the country. They have to be in the United States. And then the most stringent, stringent requirement is that the child has to have a state court order making certain findings regarding the abuse, abandonment, neglect that they've been exposed to or that they've been subjected to. Um, in Nebraska, and, and this court order has to be entered before the child reaches the age of the majority. That is the law in the state that they're currently residing in. So in Nebraska, we all know that the age of majority is 19. In Iowa, it's 18. So what that means is the state that the child is living in, they have to get a Nebraska order before the child turns 19. If they don't get a state court order from the judge before they turn 19, then SIJ is not an option for that child, even though they have until they're 21 to apply for it. If they haven't obtained the state court order before they reach the age of majority, it's not an option for them. There are very rare circumstances where perhaps we could go back to the court um, the juvenile court if the, if the child was in jurisdiction to ask for some type of amended order. But that option is very rare. And so it's important if you're working with a kid in juvenile court, it's very, very important to get them an immigration legal consultation as soon as possible so they don't age out and risk the possibility of not having this form of relief as an option. The specific findings that we need to get in that state court order are basically just findings of fact regarding the child's best interest. They're finding the facts that judges already do in state court proceedings. Um, the judge has to find that the child has, in fact, been abused, abandoned, or neglected by one or both of the parents. If there's just one abusive or neglectful or abandoning parent, that's okay. The court order just simply has to describe the abuse, abandonment, neglect that that one parent has done. The order also has to say that reunification with that one or both parents is not viable for that child, and that it's not in the child's best interest to return to their home country. So you might ask, what kind of judges or what kind of courts can make these orders that we need for an SIJ application? The SIJ federal legislation describes those courts as juvenile courts. That's kind of confusing because then we'll think, oh, well, it's only the separate juvenile court that can make those findings. So it's only when kids are in juvenile 
court jurisdiction that they can then become eligible for SID, and that's actually not true. Um, juvenile court, the separate juvenile court obviously does qualify as a juvenile court. It can be in abuse and neglect cases, the 3A cases, or it can be in delinquency cases under 3A or 3B. Um, any cases where the juvenile court has jurisdiction over that child would count as a juvenile court for SIJ purposes. But if a child's not in juvenile court jurisdiction or they're not in proceedings right now, there are other um, avenues for that child to obtain that state court order to get the SIJ findings. Guardianships um, are, are a great option if the child is here without both parents. So if you have a distant family member or a friend of the family or anyone that's not the biological parent of the child providing the care for the child, a guardianship is a great option. If the child here was one parent and they were abused, abandoned, and neglected by the other parent, then that parent who has not abused, abandoned, and neglected can ask the court for a custody or paternity order if the child was not born during the marriage. If the parents are married, um, the non-abusive or neglectful, abandoning parent can ask for a divorce or a legal separation and within that case can ask for a custody determination with the SIJ findings. Um, there, and this is not an exclusive list. There's other things that we can think about doing. Uh, there's adoption, obviously. Probate court has some other options. Um, uh, for a domestic violence protection order, has, the judge has the ability to enter a custody order, a temporary custody order for three months. Perhaps we could get SIJ findings within that temporary custody order. So this is not an exhaustive list, but like I said before, guardianships, custody, divorce, or juvenile court cases are the most common ways that Virginia and I have been able to get the state court orders um, to include the SIJ findings. Now this I'm obviously not going to read, but it is an example of what an SIJ factual finding would look like in your court order. This example comes straight from a guardian, uh, an order appointing a guardian for a minor child. But similar language could also be inserted in a custody order, a divorce decree, things of that nature. Um, it's really important to include, not just simply say the words abuse, abandonment, neglect, but it's important to define what those words mean. Um, you can cite the statute, which you can find those de definitions for in Nebraska. But also you are going to want to provide some details about what the child was specifically um, subjected to. So if the child um, has been physically abused or sexually abused, you're going to want to include that in the order. If the child's been neglected, for example, if they're forced to work without pay, they're forced to work long hours, they're forced to drop out of school, or they've never been to school, never been to the doctor, things of that nature, you're going to want to include that in your order. Um, something that's important to note here, and we might be able to touch on it more, is oftentimes when you're talking to the child, if you say things like, have your mom or dad abused you, they're going to say no. Um, our definition of abuse, abandonment, and neglect might look a lot different than the child's definition of abuse, abandonment, or neglect. So just because the child isn't verbally identifying that they've been subjected to these horrible things, if you ask questions about what it was like at home before they left their mom or dad's house, you can get some of these details that should be an indication to you that, oh, oh maybe this child is eligible for SIJ. Maybe I do need to make sure they have an immigration consultation. So the SAJ process, um, Virginia explained that you know the applications are going to go to USCIS. Um, but like we just clarified, that's not where the SAJ process starts. It starts with you guys identifying that someone is in need of immigration legal intervention, and we start working on the state, the underlying state court procedure, right? So um, we need to get that state court order that either declares the child dependent on the court, this would be in juvenile court, or gets um, the child placed into the custody of an individual in our agency, which could be juvenile court, but also could be those guardianships, custody divorce cases. And that's where the um, SIJ predicate findings will come in. In that order, we need to get the findings that the child has been subjected to abuse, abandonment, and neglect that it's not viable that they're reunified with their parent or parents, and that it's not in their best interest to return to their home country. Only after we've gotten that order can we then think about applying for SIJ. 
Um, you start the application for SIJ using the application that is called the I360. We might say that again. Um, but we have to actually attach the state court order to the I-360 and some other identifying documents for the child, and um, that's submitted. We just got a question about the time frame applicable to the no viable reunification test. Um, so a lot of people hear no viable reunification and they think that must mean parental termination, right? That means we, there has to be a termination of parental rights. That's not actually what's required by USCIS. What's required is that in this moment, it does not appear that reunification is going to be viable while the child is still a minor. So even if you think, well, maybe somewhere down the road, we're not ready to terminate parental rights, um, but reunification isn't viable right now, it's fine to go forward and get that because that's all that's required by USCIS and the federal statute. And that's a really great question because judges um, sometimes have the um, expectation that SIJ findings can only be given in parental termination cases, and that's just that's not true. Um, but once you've gotten the appropriate SIJ findings, you file the I-360. If the I-360 petition is approved and there's a visa available, the child can move to the next step to apply to adjust their status to become a LPR or green card holder. Um, these cases are taking a really, really long time because right now there's no visas available for SIJ youth from Mexico or um, Central America, like the Northern Triangle, which includes Guatemala, Honduras, and El Salvador. So right now we have a lot of kiddos um, in, on our client list that are approved uh, with SIJ status. Their I-360s have been approved, um, but they're kind of in a, a holding period because they can't apply to just to get their green card yet because there's no visas available. One of the reasons that it's important to start this process right away is one, because of the um, age out risk, but also what we talked about, the um, SIJ application provides access to some benefits for the child. Um, once their visa becomes available, then they can apply to become a green card holder or LPR by filing a separate application called the I-45 to USCIS and other identity identification documents and application fees. This requires a medical exam, and there's a lot of different um, safety precautions that come into play. Um, we have a question. It, it says, I thought if the child was in out-of-home care for 18 out of the last 22 months, termination of parental rights had to be considered. Does that not apply here? Um, so when I'm talking about ter termination of parental rights and, and the finding that um, it's not viable for reunification, so we're talking about federal law and what's required for special immigrant juvenile status, and so that's a different requirement. This um, reunification is not viable, and so even if you're not looking at termination, they haven't, for example, been in out-of-home care for 18 months, um, that means you can still go forward. So that's all that I'm saying as far as um, you don't have to look at termination of parental rights. And, you know, if that's what it is, that's what it is, and we can still get the SIJ predicate order even when we're considering termination in a kiddo's case, but let's be honest, um, in juvenile court, kids are in juvenile uh, court jurisdiction and out-of-home placements for, for very, very long periods of time. And that stall is not going to prohibit the kid from applying for SIJ. So I think the point that we're trying to get across, thank you for that question, though. Um, something that we like to point out is that um, when a judge is making the SIJ findings, it doesn't automatically mean that the child is going to get approved for SIJ or that they're going to get a green card. There are um, additional safety measures at play. The child's criminal record is oftentimes examined. Their biometrics are taken. What that means is their fingerprints and their pictures are taken. They're subjected to a, a very invasive medical exam. Um, when I say invasive, like the doctor will literally look at every inch of the child's body looking for signs of gang activity like tattoos, 
scars, things of that nature. The child's subjected to an interview by an immigration officer most of the time. Um, and if there's any type of uh, concern or issue that would make the immigration officers think that the child's inadmissible, then that child's not going to move on to become an LPR or you know, towards their path to citizenship. So when we have the Nebraska judge who says, I don't really know if this child qualifies to be a, a green card holder or a citizen, it's our job to make sure that the judge knows you are not making immigration decisions here. We don't ask you to take these safety measures to try to figure out whether or not this child is admissible to the United States because that's USCIS's job and they're doing it. Um, so I've already touched on this on the last slide, but, but basically the state order is required before the child can apply for SIJ. That doesn't mean that the state court order equals SIJ. It's a very, very nuanced distinction, but I think it's very clear, in my mind at least, that um, federal law requires the state court judges to make these findings a fact. And the reason is immigration judges and immigration officers, they're not trained like our state court judges are to deal with the best interests of the child. They're not trained to make these factual findings about abuse, abandonment, neglect. The state court judges are. So that's why federal law directs state court judges to make the factual findings. Once the factual findings are made, then federal law dictates that federal authorities make the immigration findings. So while we do need the state court order to apply for SIJ, um, it doesn't guarantee that SIJ is going to be granted, if that makes sense. Um, so we're now going to move on and talk a little bit about some other um, relief options which might be available um, to the children that you're working with. And part of the reason why this is important is, as Mindy mentioned earlier, um, when a child receives special immigrant juvenile status and then goes on to receive residency, even though they're a permanent resident and even though they're a citizen, they can never turn around and petition for their parents. And many children who potentially are in a situation where you know, their mom or their dad was also a victim of abuse want to be able to turn around and be able to help that parent at some point. And so special immigrant juvenile status may not be the best option and there may be other options for them. It's important to kind of at least have a basic understanding uh, when you're working with these children of what are all of the potential options which may be um, available to them to then decide is it best to go forward with special immigrant juvenile status or might we want to consider something else. Um, and the first other potential option that we wanted to bring up is Deferred Action for Childhood Arrivals or DACA. This has been in the news a lot and things are changing daily. Um, so we wanted to give you a little bit of an update about what, what the program is and what's currently happening with it. And um, another reason why this is important, I once had um, a foster mom come in who told me, you know, my child has special immigrant juvenile status, um, we want to look at, at getting permanent residency for them, and I took a look at their card and I said, no, they, you don't have special immigrant juvenile status, you have DACA. Um, and both she and the caseworker had been under the assumption that special immigrant juvenile status had already happened, but no, um, the child had actually received DACA. So it's important to know what DACA is to be able to make sure um, that the best possible option is there for the, ch the children that you're working with. So what is this program? What are the basic requirements of uh, the DACA program? So in order to qualify, an individual must have arrived in the United States before they were 16 years old. So 15 or younger. They must have been under 31 on um, June 15, 2012, the date that the program was started. It was an executive order by President Obama back in 2012. And they must be able to show that they've been continually present in the United States since 2007. So that means since 2007, up until today, they've lived in the United States. There may have been um, brief exits and entries, but nothing more than six months. Um, and they must have shown that they studied in the United States. So um, that could mean that they got their GED. That could mean they went to high school, went to college, um, had to have graduated from high school, or be currently studying. Um, and or if they're in the military. Um, if they are in the military or have been in the military, they don't have to necessarily um, have studied in the United States or have graduated from a United States school. And then they have to pass uh, a stringent background check and show that they're a good moral character, that they're not going to be any risk um, to the public safety of the United States. Um, now it's important to know, and 
hopefully you've heard about this in the news, that DACA is not a pathway to permanent residency. It is not a pathway to citizenship. It is only a temporary protection from deportation. You can get work authorization and the ability to apply for a social security number, um, as well as a driver's or a professional license, but it's only temporary. Um, they're renewed for two-year periods, and um, as you may have heard, President Trump is attempting to end the program, and so now you can no longer initially apply for DACA. Um, so this is kind of the update. Just this last week, um, the DACA program, well, sorry, back in September, President Trump and the administration um, rescinded the DACA program, so they ended it. Um, but just last week, a district court judge in um, San Francisco, California, the Northern District of California, issued an order mandating that USCIS resume accepting DACA applications for individuals that had previously been granted DACA. So no new applications. If you didn't already have it or don't already have it, you can't apply. But if you currently have it, you can apply to renew under the injunction that was put down last week. Um, but we don't know how long that's going to last because the administration is appealing that order. They appealed to the Ninth Circuit, and then just last night, they actually appealed to the Supreme Court. So we don't know what's going to happen with the DACA program. Currently, if an individual has it, they can apply to renew, but we don't know for how long that will be available, and we don't know what's going to happen in the future. Um, so this is just you know, information about that injunction. We've been getting a lot of questions. Anyone who has previously been granted DACA can go on and apply under this court order. Um, and they sh if someone is in this situation, they could, should consult with an immigration professional as quickly as possible. As I said, we don't know what's going to happen with this program, and we don't know how long um, this window to continue to renew is going to be, um, is, is going to be open. As, as it says, it even says here, looking to take this fight to the Supreme Court as we did this presentation yesterday. And last night, they appealed to the Supreme Court. So things are changing very quickly with the DACA program. So other options for individuals, um, especially victims who have been, um, individuals who have been victims of crime, the first would be the U visa. Um, to get a U visa, you have to have been the victim of a qualifying crime. And the next slide I'll put up will show you what exactly is a qualifying crime. Um, you have to sub suffer substantial physical or mental abuse as a result of the crime of which you were a victim, possess information about that crime, and have been helpful, be currently helpful, or likely to be helpful with an investigation or prosecution of one of the crimes. Um, and a lot of questions I get about, well, what does that mean, have been helpful? I, I called the police, I told them about it, but then they never followed up with me. Can I still qualify? Yes. As long as you did your part in the investigation and never refused to continue to cooperate, um, if you called the police, uh, you can, you qualify under this. You have been helpful in the investigation of a crime. So going on to what are these qualifying crimes, I'm not going to go through all of them. All of them are up here on this board, a couple that I'll just highlight that we see a lot of, domestic violence crimes, um, sexual assault crimes, trafficking I'll mention because of the next slide, um, and, and rape. But there is a list, and stalking is another one that we see fairly frequently um, where people are qualifying for U visas. But if it's not on the list, um, still worth investigating because the statute allows for any similar activity. Um, so it's important to look at, even if it's not named, this particular qualifying crime, what actually happened, and is it similar to any of these potential crimes to see if an individual might be eligible for a U visa. Um, so a very similar type of relief that only goes to individuals who have been victims of human trafficking is the T visa. So um, an individual must show that they were a victim of a severe form of trafficking in person. Um, and that could be sex or labor trafficking, have physical presence in the United States on account of such trafficking. Um, now, if for instance an individual came to the United States and was then a victim of trafficking, they can still potentially qualify, um, but they have to be in the United States. Then they comply with a reasonable request for assistance in the investigation or prosecution of that trafficking. 
There is, however, an exception. With the U visa, there's no exception. You have to have been helpful. With the, um, with the T visa, if you are under 18 or you are unable to cooperate due to physical or psychological trauma, you can um, qualify for the exception um, of complying with a reasonable request for assistance in that case. And you have to show that you would be able to, you, you would suffer extreme hardship involving unusual and severe harm if you were to be removed to a different country. Now, I mentioned that both the U visa and the T visa are, can, um, can benefit people who have been victims of trafficking. Trafficking is a qualifying crime on the U visa. So how do you go about deciding whether a person should apply for the U visa or a T visa? Well, here are some statistics. For the T visa, um, by law, they can grant 5,000 applications every year. They can grant 10,000 U visa applications. So more U visa applications than T visa. In this past year, the fiscal year 2017, 2,259 T visa applications were filed, while 61,686 U visa applications were filed. So you can already see here we have a problem. You have more people filing than visas that are available. Not the same filing, not the same problem here with the two visa. If you look at how many applications are currently pending, you have 2,276 T visas. So again, that fits within this 5,000 cap. Or with the U visa, you have 190,361 visa applications pending. That is clearly outside of this 10,000 possible visas that they can grant every year. And if you do the math, it's about 19 years for a person that's applying right now until they can potentially get their visa. So they're currently processing T visa applications that received February 20th, 2017, almost a year waiting for the visa. Whereas here, they're currently processing applications received August 25th, 2014. So if you have an individual who's eligible for both the U visa and the T visa, I strongly recommend potentially looking at the T visa because it's going to be a lot faster path to relief than the potential U visa. And, that, and this wait time is important to consider, especially if you're looking with a child who's potentially eligible for a U visa or special immigrant juvenile status um, based on the, the fact that they've been a victim of a crime. Uh, this wait time is going to be a serious consideration. Um, so going to other types of humanitarian relief, specifically asylee refugee status, I know we're moving quickly on these. Um, but a refugee or an asylee is actually the same legal definition. It's an individual who is unable or unwilling to return um, to their home country because of a well-founded fear of persecution based on one of five reasons. Their race, their religion, their nationality, their political opinion, or their membership in a particular social group. So what's the difference? If it's the same definition, what's the difference between a refugee and an asylee? It's where they're granted that status. So a refugee is going to be granted their refugee status outside of the United States in a refugee camp and allowed to come to the United States as a refugee. An asylee is somebody who comes to the United States, fleeing persecution, applies for status within the United States and is granted their status within the United States after coming. So that's the difference between a refugee and an asylee. Um, I think it's important, to, and you might be getting here, Virginia, yeah. but just to uh, note that there are no refugee camps in Central or South America. So our kids that are fleeing persecution from Mexico or Central America, or, or South America for that matter, they don't have the option of entering as a refugee, and so they would be limited to applying for asylum. Thanks, Cindy. Um, just wanted to mention that um, asylum refugee status um, you can get it as a derivative status. So for example, you may be working with a child who has derivative asylee or refugee status because their parents were granted that relief. And so they got it because they were included on that parent's application. And that's important because you know I've had conversations with people and they're like, yes, I'm working with this child who's an immigrant, but they're fine because they have asylee refugee status. Well, if you think back to that original um, slide where we showed the different types of status and we talked about how important it is for an individual child to try and get to as stable an immigration status as possible, you have asylee or refugee status. Within one year of receiving that status, you're eligible to apply for permanent residency and then to eventually apply for citizenship. And so if they're sitting with asylee or refugee status, it's important to look at are they eligible for lawful permanent resident status. 
especially if they got their status as a derivative, because there are ways that asylee or refugee status can be terminated, including for particular crimes. And if, for example, they've been separated from their parents because their parents have been involved in certain types of criminal activity, those parents are at risk of losing the asylee refugee status, the children would then lose it as well. So if you have a child that has asylee or refugee status, don't necessarily assume, oh, they're fine. It's important to look at how can we get them to as stable a position as possible. Should we look at applying for lawful permanent residency? Should we look at, at different potential options to continue to move them towards stability? And asylees and refugees also will time out of being eligible for public benefit. Um, so it's really important to, like Virginia said, continue your path towards citizenship so that way um, somebody that's been accustomed to, for example, receiving Medicaid um, for their health care, they're going to be prohibited from continuing it. And so it's important to continue moving forward. Thanks. Okay, so um, last but not least, we're going to talk about family-based options um, very quickly. Uh, if you've, heard question, if you've heard about chain migration, um, it's talking about family um, immigration. And so certain um, family relationships can allow you to be eligible and to petition for um, status within the United States. And so looking at what are those relationships, we're looking at what are titled immediate relatives versus preference category immigrants. So immediate relatives are the spouse, children, and parents of a US citizen. So if you're the spouse, um, a child under 21 or a parent of a child over 21 um, who is a U.S. citizen, they can do a family petition um, so that you can eventually get permanent residency. And the important thing about being an immediate relative is it means a visa is immediately available to you. You don't have to wait. If you're in a preference category, you have to wait for a visa to become available. So these relationships um, are split out into first preference, second preference, third preference, and fourth preference. So the relationships are unmarried sons and daughters of US citizens, spouses and children of lawful permanent residents, unmarried sons and daughters over 21 of lawful permanent residents, married sons and daughters of US citizens, and brothers and sisters of citizens. If it's not on this list or on this slide, it is not a relationship for which a family petition can be done. So if you have a child that's living with a grandparent, there's no um, ability to apply for a grandparent or a grandchild, for example. Um, you see brothers and sisters of citizens, no brothers and sisters of lawful permanent residents. So this can be kind of confusing, so I want to talk about how we know if a visa is available. And so I want you just to focus on this fourth preference here, the brothers and sisters of a US citizen. And we're going to do a quick poll um, to see how this works. So it's hopefully just kind of fun. But if an adult US citizen petitioned for their Mexican national sibling, how long, so here in the fourth preference, how long do you think would it take for a visa to become available? Go ahead and, and, and put in what you think the answer might be. Okay, so it looks like um, a heavy preference for over five years, um, with some people thinking over 10 years, and then a couple of people thinking longer than a lifetime, but nobody thinks less than six months. Well, you're right on that. It is not less than six months. So we flip over to this lovely chart, which immigration attorneys see in their nightmares, I think, and this is your visa bulletin. So you look for your category, and remember we were talking about fourth category, and then for your country, Mexico. And this will tell you what, year, what applications they're um, approving at this time. So right now, they're looking at applications that were filed November 1st of 1997. So you look at this and you think, oh goodness, that's about 19 years. So it'll probably take 19 years if I submit my application right now. Well, that's not the case because every year more applications are being submitted than the number of visas available. So um, I believe that the estimate for how long it's going to be is about 97 years. So if you have to, I don't know how many of you are planning on living that long. Um, you have to wait until you're over 21. So we're looking at probably longer than a lifetime, but definitely over 10 years. Um, so that's the reality of, of family-based um, um, 
family-based petitions, if you're in a preference category, you're looking at long waits in just about every single one of the categories, specifically if you're from one of the countries that have high levels of immigration to the United States. Um, there's one final option that I'll touch on. It's a VAWA petition. This is normally with family-based petitions. Um, the individual who's a U.S. citizen or a permanent resident has to apply for the family member. The VAWA petition says if you are in a relationship with a U.S. citizen or a lawful permanent resident and they are abusive, you do not have to depend on them to petition for you. You can self-petition. You can petition by yourself if you can show that you were um, subjected to extreme cruelty or battery. And so that spouses, children, and parents of U.S. citizens and lawful permanent residents um, who can petition on their own and not have to wait for their abuser to potentially exercise additional control and petition for them. So how can you help? Yes, okay, so I think if you take nothing away from this webinar other than this slide, Virginia and I will be super happy, right? Um, especially with the political climate right now, there's a lot of derogatory things that are being said all over the media and sometimes like in our own um, conversations in the community. One thing that we like to point out is that it's not appropriate to refer to someone who's undocumented as an illegal person. The term is dehumanizing for one, but it, it oftentimes, like we've already talked about, it's very complicated to understand what somebody's immigration status is. And also, um, being in the United States without a current immigration status is not a, a criminal violation, it's not a crime. Um, sometimes if you enter without permission or there are certain things that happened um, when you enter the United States, the crimes could be invoked. But just a simple fact of being present in the United States without a current immigration status is not a crime. And in fact, um, almost 40% of the undocumented population is in the United States without committing any type of unlawful entry. They entered with permission, and because of that complex path um, to citizenship, like Virginia showed you that map, for whatever reason, um, they were no longer able to, continu to continue on their path, and they've become undocumented. But they've not committed any crimes. Right now, there's uh, over 11 million individuals in the United States that are undocumented. And again, um, undocumented, non-citizen, new American, like there's lots of appropriate ways to describe our community members if we need to, but calling them illegal is not appropriate. That's like if Virginia committed a crime, I'm not going to refer to her as an illegal an illegal person, just as if we're not going to describe uh, something that's undocumented as an illegal person. And then other things to think about, like we mentioned at the beginning of the webinar, um, it's super important if you're working towards permanency with, with your kiddo in juvenile court, you have to think about their immigration status and ways that they can work towards uh, a more secure status. Um, if a child is undocumented, there's so much more going on that, than meets the eye. They're constantly um, worried about being separated from their loved ones. They don't have access to public benefits. They can't travel. If there's um, a, a death of a family member in a different area, a different country, they can't go to the funeral. They're constantly um, living in fear. They're not wanting to disclose that they're undocumented. Lots of challenges that we have when we're working with undocumented children. And then, like Virginia said, there's just so many benefits of working towards your path towards citizenship. Not only is the mental health of the child going to improve, but their self-esteem and confidence is naturally going to increase. They're going to be less vulnerable to victimization. Um, and that's victimization uh, within the family, victimization within the community, even victimization um, at the hands of attorneys or non-attorneys that are perpetuating fraud against our immigrant, immigrant population. Um, working towards your immigration also allows you to have work authorization and so being able to provide for yourself and your family and then just the overall general sense of hope. So um, we're talking about the importance of making sure someone gets an immigration uh, consultation. How do you do that, especially if you're representing a, a kid uh, that's an out-of-home placement or their family doesn't have the resources to hire a good immigration attorney? I think the best thing that we can do is we can refer our community members to the Nebraska Immigration Legal Assistance Hotline. 
It is a collaboration between a lot of the immigration nonprofit law firms or nonprofit organizations that take their intakes through this hotline. Um, anyone can call on behalf of anyone else. So if you're working with a kiddo, um, you can call the hotline to request immigration legal assistance. If there's a form of immigration relief that the kiddo qualifies for, the hotline is going to refer that case to the immigration legal service provider that's going to help the kid the best, the fastest. Um, if the kid's already in juvenile court, you can work with the attorney, especially if there's a GAL appointed, to actually have the juvenile judge appoint an immigration attorney to help the kid get the SIJ findings they need. But you're going to want to initially have that immigration consultation to see, one, whether the child qualifies for any immigration benefit, and two, if they qualify for more than one, what option is the best option for the child. So I think just having the NELA number handy, being able to refer people to the NELA hotline is one great way that we can help the children that we work with, but also anyone in the community. The next slide, um, basically we're going to try to put another poll up here, and it's an option for you to give us your contact information and give us the questions or um, your request for more information. So what that means is, do you need some memory at legal center? We can send those to you. Do you need some rights and planning, uh, safety planning guides? This would be um, to work with your families that have undocumented individuals in their families, how they can prepare for, um, how they can get immigration legal assistance and prepare for possible detention or removal proceedings, things of that nature. Um, do you need another presentation? Would you like uh, an immigration attorney to come to your group uh, employment to talk more about a specific form of relief. This is an option to enter those things. We're not going to publish them, so it's okay to put your contact information in there. Um, but I think we're out of time. Yeah. Uh, we're we're going to stick around for a few minutes, though, so if anybody has questions, you can unmute your phone and actually talk with us, or you can type them into the chat box. We're going to be here. Our contact information is on the screen. Feel free at any time to shoot us emails, and we'll help you uh, in a, whatever way we can. And we wanted, for those of you who are to the ground, thank you so much for participating and uh, being with us over the lunch hour. All right, guys, seeing that there's nobody that um, has any questions that they want to put out to the group, we're going to go ahead and end the call. But thanks again.